What I was conscious of was the fact that they were from Fife and that they were the first <laughs> the first successful band I could ever remember from the outside, maybe in Nazareth, yeah, yeah. but they were of that period they were the successful band and seeing them on top of the pops and doing into the valley and everybody in Fife said, Oh, it's about Valley Field and all that, you know, and everybody everybody knew them and they were local celebs and they were great, you know. And um, it's funny, I thought about uh, I thought about Stuart Adamson at the weekend. We were at the football in Dunfermline, watching the Hibs get beat. Yeah. Uh, he would have been very happy had he been there because uh, they won, and probably in the end they did deserve to win. It was got a good goal. But the fact that he was a big Dunfermline fan and, that, and um, it just made you think because he'd been missing for so long, and uh, one began to fear the worst. And unfortunately, that was the case, you know. Well, I don't know how Stuart would have felt about a pair of high bees singing his praises, but I do know he'd be happy to be remembered by the man who used to steer Dunfermline Athletic. These days, he's at Livingston, and speaking on the line from Ammonville now is Jim Leishman. Jim, welcome. I, I think they still play in a big country at, uh, at East End Park. You're there in the, the visitors' dugout these days, but I'm sure you have fond memories of the place and of Stuart. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I'm really enjoying listening to, to everybody's, uh, um, you know... Um, Opinion about Stuart and how they've thought of him. It he was he was a fantastic guy. Football was just you know apart from the music was his life and uh, it was just a, a pleasure to know him. He he'd be loving the pars being in the Premier League and beating Hibs as Craig oh. O'Charlie says. You know. Did you see him much at uh, at the ground? When I was a manager, I saw a lot of him. The, the, the one time where I saw him every single day for a week was uh, he came up to me. We, we were I was I was just after the game, and he, he asked me if uh, if I would consider um, letting them rehearse at East End Park. You know, uh, and I said it'd be great. And they were, I don't know what the cost of uh, rental space, studio space down in London was, but um, uh, we charged them a thousand quid for a week. And uh, they came in, all the sound control stuff, the the guitars, the drums, everything was in the gymnasium, the old gymnasium. And every day the boys were in, Tony and and uh, and um, uh, Stuart, Bruce and Mark. They were rehearsing. It was uh, it was just such an honour for me to be there and listen to them. And when they played that, they played the first time I heard "Look Away, Look Away." Mm. It was absolutely fantastic. Just being, you know the. You, you were actually jumping up and down in the gymnasium. You know, I was a football manager, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just jumping up and down in the, in the gym listening to these guys. Terrific. Jim, so, they, they were, sorry, Brian, they, 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 they were just so pleased being in. After the, the rehearsal, they hated rehearsing, and after the rehearsal, they jump in the big bath at them film. You know, there were, there were four guys in the big bath. Then they would go, they says, we're training, Jim, you know, we're going for training. So they would run around the park once and then get a ball out and just... Uh, it would be two aside on this the, the, the big football park at East End, you know. The, I said, look at them, they're like wee boys, you know. Yes. It was great. Jim, you're a bit of a poet yourself, and he was uh, he was a great rock poet, wasn't he? Yeah, wonderful, uh, wonderful lyrics. He, he, he was terrific. Um, I don't know if, if, if any of you guys know, but George McNeil and I, we did a show once in Carnegie Hall, Dunfermline. It was called Unleashed with Jim and George, and it was about our football ditties and our football stories, etc. And there was a bit of music in it, and I was sure to come along and... Uh, and maybe just gig for, for a song, you know, or two songs. And I asked him for about six, seven weeks, and he kept saying, look, Jim, he's phoned his back, you know, and when the morning, the Sunday morning, I went along to the Tappy Tourist, you know, Stuart was in upstairs, and he was strumming his guitar, and I said, are you coming along, Stuart? He said, look, I, look, I think I'll make it, I think. And I went on stage just to fill in, because Stuart hadn't turned up, you see, <laughs> and I'm ready to do an extra five, ten minutes. And then I saw at the side Stuart Adamson with his guitar, you know, <laughs> an acoustic guitar. So he turned up, uh, the, the bugger had turned up. I was trying to think of what stories I'm going to do extra. He's got this lead, plugs it into the guitar, and he sang a song about a wee red book, right? And it was about Dunfermline when he was a young supporter at the Pars. And he wrote this song about wee, some, he had lost his wee red book or, or somebody had stolen it. And he had Jock Steen, who was the greatest manager at Dunfermline ever, you know? And, and uh, he had Jock Steen's autograph in this. And he, I, I wish I had a copy of the, the song, you know? It was just something he had made up, and it was it was terrific. And you've seen all these old old folk in the audience, you know, and they're all clapping and tapping away. And I'll never, I'll never forget, and I'll love them forever for just doing that five, ten minutes for us, you know? Well, Billy Sloan, he never lost that, uh, that, that Coleman touch, did he? No, he didn't. I mean, we did a, a, a concert for Kosovan refugees in, in 1999 for the Sunday Mail, and I basically had to organise the concert at six weeks' notice. And we asked some of the biggest names in the Scottish music scene at that time, and a lot of them, I have to say, uh, were totally disinterested and didn't even return our calls. But I suddenly got a phone call out the blue from Stuart Adamson, who'd been told about it by his manager, Ian Grant, and uh, he says, I'm in Nashville, but, you know, I'd like to help. What can I do? And I said, well, you know... 
how can you help? Because, you know, geographically, you're thousands of miles away. He says, it's OK, I'll jump in a plane, I'll get the band together. Uh, we've been working with Eddie Reader on the new album. I'll give her a call and see if she can come down. You know, I'll, I'll phone another few friends. And they came along to the SEC, and I mean, they took the roof off the place. And we, we, we raised a quarter of a million pounds for charity, and that went to medical supplies and, and blankets and stuff for the people in Pristina. And um, it was a nightmare six weeks to try and organise it, but I ended up feeling really proud of it because just when we were feeling down and we were in a bit of a black hole and it looked as if you know the thing was going to be a, a total disaster, you got a little boost like that from, from Stuart Adamson and then you know a few months later we went over to Pristina and did a gig with, uh, with them and Lulu and um, he was really affected walking about a place that looked like uh, the movie set of the, of the film Independence Day, you know there was all these bombed out buildings and people had been turned out of their house right. and we were hearing all this stories of atrocity and, and I mean you know he, he, he was very very moved by that as we all were but that's the kind of guy he was, if there was any way he could have helped you he would help you, I mean he was first to sort of put his hand up and say what can I do? Well Eddie you, you were saying you were working or Billy was saying you were working with him out there in, uh, in Nashville, what do you remember of those oh, sessions? No they, we, did it, we did it at home um, well, here, you know, not, not in Nashville, I think he had come over, I got a call and there was this lovely wee song that they had called Fragile Thing, um, which was a very gentle song, because when someone said Big Country, I was kind of thinking, well, wait a minute, is that not what's of loud guitars and big, beautiful anthem-type stuff that I wouldn't, nobody's going to hear me, I've got this wee voice. And then they played me this demo and it was so lovely, it was just really gentle and uh, I think he must have been influenced by, by working in Nashville or something, because it sounded so... Um, well, like you know, lots of there was a. I think there was a steel in it. I don't know. Tony right. will tell you more. But there was. It was just. A, there was sort of. A, it was a totally different thing from what I'd imagined. And then, of course, you know, uh, they took me down to where they were rehearsing, which is just off the M25. And and we all. I, I brought my son and his pal down after school, and they set up. They had all the martial amps set up, and they played some really brilliant loud music. And the Waynes were loving it. It was great. Well, we're going to hear from uh, Tony Butler, as you say, in just a, a minute or two. But as Stuart himself was saying at the uh, at the top of the the program, there, it was always about music, and it was always about a particular view of of Scotland and the world, a view that was sometimes tinged with loss and sorrow, but it was always boiling with passion.